Okay, so uh, thank you for the uh, opportunity uh, to talk to you and to share uh, some of the uh, work my research group does. Um, a few uh, remarks I should say at the beginning. Uh, there's no uh, single problem that I kind of have focused my career on. I like problems, and uh, so I like thinking about uh, new problems and different problems and work with my research group on them. And so um, the work my group has done uh, it, it's, it's really their work, um, and I get to talk about it. And so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about some of the things we've been doing. Um, so I, I'm trained in uh, fluid mechanics, and uh, um, because I like problems, uh, my group has kind of explored a number of different things. And I don't, I should say, work directly in turbulence. I work in problems that have uh, complexity in them another way because of materials in them. So there are material links to the kinds of problems I work on. So um, I work in flow and porous media. And for example, a modern application we've been trying to think about is how do we use the laboratory to think about hydrofracture. Um, my work does a lot of, my group does a lot of collaborative work with people in molecular biology. And so we've kind of discovered uh, a number of new things that relate to the combination of biofilms and flow when you have both together. We've discovered over the last four years four or five different things that the community wasn't aware of. Um, I work in the area of colloid science, which generally means small particles in fluid. And the very end of the talk, I realize there are one or two people from chemistry. The very end of the talk, I'll show you a, a concept in physical chemistry that many people will have heard of. I'll show you the out of equilibrium version of it. And I'll show you how you might be able to clean water in a very energy efficient way. Um, most of the work my group does involves very viscous systems. They're very small systems, but there is one analogy to large scale systems, which are ice. Ice has a rheology like viscous fluids, and my group has recognized that some of the modeling we do applies to uh, understanding how ice bridges form in a geometry that has a narrow strait, which is a geometry that climate models have trouble with. And so we've been able to do kind of an analysis that helps with that. These are just random things. Um, recently, we've been thinking about um, modern additive manufacturing and the role of rheology and the role of fluid mechanics. And um, finally, we have a very curious thing, uh, two random problems that have happened in the last year. One in, is, how do you take materials that are, don't like water, hydrophobic materials, and actually clean them using water? And we've discovered a way to do this. And um, uh, We've actually kind of, it sounds funny, we, we, we understand something about fluid mechanics in a latte, and uh, this happened kind of by accident, but we've used it now to make a structured material. Um, it's not part of the talk, but it's something that I've been doing recently. So these are kind of things that we, my group thinks about. They all have fluid mechanics in them. They all have complexity in them in the sense of what the community would call a complex fluid. Okay, so I'm going to start with a few slides that tell you why I think fluid mechanics is interesting. Uh, going to try and convince you of that. Uh, then I have uh, four short stories. One is a classic fluid mechanics problem that's called viscous fingering. And I'm going to point out a way to control it using a geometric feature that no one had uh, considered before. Um, work with Ki Han, Kim, and um, uh, Tom Fu involves a flow over li so-called liquid infused surfaces. These are materials that have a large amount of liquid present near the surface. Most of the community focuses on the idea of what is the effective slip of the surface? And my group focused on how do you keep the liquid there if it's actually in a flow situation? Um, we kind of stumbled on a, 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 a very common engineering application, which is flow in a T-shape. And we discovered something about uh, multi-phase flows that everyone had uh, missed, all the numerics people, all the experimental people. I don't know if it's important, but I'm going to show you something that I think is quite interesting. And, the geometry is so simple, I think it's many places. And finally, I promised at the end a little chemistry problem where you use fluid mechanics and chemistry to try and clean water. Okay, So I'm going to kind of go through things. It's a fluid mechanics talk without equations. It's going to be ideas, concepts, pictures. And hopefully, uh, if you want to uh, talk to me afterwards, I'd be thrilled. OK, so why is fluid mechanics possibly interesting? So uh, well, it's what's today, Tuesday? Tuesday. So OK, so um, it was. Friday would be better. OK, so uh, you have a glass of wine. Um, you look at a glass of wine. You see when you uh, swirl a glass typically of uh, 
wine or hard liqueur, if you swirl the glass and create a thin film of liquid on the glass, the liquid actually climbs up and makes a, a, a thick rim at the top, which then goes gravitationally unstable, and these so-called fingers or legs in a glass of wine are a fluid mechanical phenomena. Uh, they're associated with the name Marangoni, who was an obscure 19th century uh, Italian physicist. And um, if you're really at a boring dinner party, they're a great way to get out of uh, trouble by having a little conversation about the fluid mechanical process that's the legs in a glass of wine. And I could tell you much more about it, uh, but the phenomena behind this involves surface tension variations, and those variations are even part of now a patent for cleaning um, um, materials called Marangoni cleaning. Okay, so it's a nice example of uh, an idea that has other technological applications. Okay, in, in some areas of fluid mechanics civil engineering, uh, you hear about a so-called hydraulic jump. Uh, the hydraulic jump, which you can see in a kitchen sink, is a jet of water. It hits the bottom. It spreads out very quickly. It then, um, uh, at a finite radius, jumps up to a thicker film. So you can see that the hydraulic jump has a certain radius associated with it, where the flow is very fast. The Reynolds, local Reynolds number is very large. And then at a finite radius, the film is thicker. An interesting question you can ask, which is not easy to answer, is what is the radius of the hydraulic jump, and how does it depend on the flow rate of the liquid. Okay, so my group uh, often does microfabrication. And see, we got interested in the question, what does the hydraulic jump look like when you use modern microfabricated materials? So we um, did the same kind of experiment where we take a surface that's otherwise smooth inside the central circular region, which is outlined by this circle, is a patch. This patch has a microfabricated surface on it of posts. The posts are uh, measured in uh, tens of microns in radius, 100 microns in height, and 100 microns in spacing. Uh, 100 microns is the diameter of the human hair, for those of you fortunate enough to still have yours. Um, okay, so, uh, so this micro pattern is so fine you really don't see it in the central patch. And now you can ask uh, what happens when you increase the flow speed of water. So I'm going to turn on the movie, and the only thing I have to say is uh, this is a square pattern on the right. The pattern in the experiment turns out to be hexagonal. Okay, so now when you uh, turn on the movie and you increase the flow rate, you get a hydraulic jump. The hydraulic jump is hexagonal. The hydraulic jump exists outside the region of the pattern. So this shows uh, a number of different things. It points out that the fluid mechanics has a memory. Here the memory comes through the inertia of the fluid and the fact that the uh, memory takes into account something about the friction the fluid feels with the substrate. So it's a very nice example of a coupling between the flow and the substrate friction. And so we, we've kind of done modeling on it, we've done experiments, and, um, but the picture gets the idea that there's uh, an interesting interplay between the two. Okay. Yeah. Ah, uh, okay. So, f okay. So, f so first of all, I guess I could say we haven't done the experiment, so I can't answer definitively. But I can give you probably a 98% accurate or, uh, answer that's likely to be right. 98% probably. So uh, the role of the salt will only change the density a little and change the viscosity a little. Those are parameters in here, and they have a very weak effect. They typically just give the Reynolds number. They also modify the surface tension, but that also has a weak effect. So I don't think they'll have a very large effect at all at the Reynolds numbers we work at. Okay? All right, so um, uh, finally I'll, I'll just close this introduction with this shorebird. This shorebird called a phalarope lives in shallow water. When it gets hungry, it um, does this. It spins in circles and pecks on the surface. Anybody know why? So um, because it lives in shallow water, by spinning in a circle, it creates a vortex. The vortex brings up uh, nutrients from below because the shorebird doesn't like to get its head wet. It just has to peck at the surface. Okay, one of my former graduate students, hmm? That's very clever. 
that's why I'm showing this. But not only is it clever, um, not only is it clever, uh, one of my former graduate students uh, gave a talk where he showed uh, this kind of movie in front of a thousand people at an American Physical Society meeting. And at the end of the talk, there were no questions. And that always upsets me. So I stood up and I said, does this mean the shorebird knows more about fluid mechanics than we do? And he said in front of a thousand people, I cannot speak for everyone in the room, but I can assure you the, fluid, the shorebird knows more about fluid mechanics than my PhD advisor. <laughs> OK, so that's my introduction just about different things in uh, fluid mechanics. And, uh, and so um, because I like puzzles, I'm going to show you a number of things we've looked at over the years that involve uh, multi-phase flows. So interfaces are important. And in several cases, geometry matters. And I'm going to show you a number of examples where the geometry is simple. And you'd think it's so simple that someone would have looked at it. And all I can assure you is they haven't. For whatever reasons, people focused on kind of traditional things. OK, so the first problem is called. Uh, a viscous fingering problem. And the way we ran across this is we were using small devices, so-called microfluidic devices, to make materials, usually making materials in the form of small droplets. So the typical dimension here is a couple hundred microns, and the width into the page is about 100 microns. And we were interested in um, uh, kind of how a droplet of fluid, in this case the fluid is eight times more viscous than the surrounding fluid, how it might break if it uh, hits a post. And what we discovered was that if the droplet interacts with the post at low speeds, in fact, it doesn't break. Uh, the two menisci hit the gap, and in, in fact, the droplet passes the post without breaking. Whereas if you do the identical experiment, you do the identical experiment at, at higher speed, then above a critical speed, the drop interacts with the post. Um, the two menisci hit the gap, both pass the gap, and the drop, it turns out, breaks into two. Now, they're not equal size, but you get now a distribution of drop sizes. And so there's a critical speed above which the drop breaks, and so we're interested in what controls the critical speed. But the strange thing about this from a fluid mechanics point of view, if, you, if you've ever studied small systems, is normally when a, a high viscosity fluid invades a low viscosity fluid, you never expect instability. You expect the the fluid just to invade uniformly. So we, we looked at this picture, and after about two years, we, des we described it as a, an instability. Now, I just have to get the words right. The instability I'm referring to, we, we focused on the menisci. And when the two menisci, when one gets outcompeted by the other, we call that unstable. And when both menisci advance through the gaps together, we say, well, that was, that was stable. They were going together. OK. So, um, after a long time, we drew an, uh, an analogy to a famous paper from G.I. Taylor, probably the most famous mechanics person of the 20th century, who with Philip Safman wrote a paper on um, what, what's called viscous fingering. It's called sometimes the Safman-Taylor instability. And the pictures you normally see look like this. If you invade a low viscosity fluid into a high viscosity fluid, you never get a uniform invasion. It always invades in the form of uh, finger-like structures where the high viscosity fluid gets left behind and the low viscosity fluid just propagates right through it. If it's radial, you see radial fingers. Um, this problem has almost 2,000 citations. It's um, been studied ad infinitum. And it turns out over um, more than 50 years, there's one thing in common about this experiment. Every experimentalist and every uh, theorist and every numerical simulator has always considered the case where the two boundaries are exactly parallel. So if you were to look at this gap, the experiment always has a uniform gap. 2,000 papers on this topic. And it turns out the analogy we made is that if the experiment had been done slightly differently, the results are completely different. And the analogy we're going to make is geometric and has to do with the fact that we're going to ask, what happens if the walls aren't parallel? And when that happens, the physics are different. And I'll explain why. So we looked at this picture. We said, you have to focus on the gap. The gap is basically parabolic. In one case, the two menisci try to go through the parabolic gap, and one gets outcompeted by the other. And in the case on the right, the two menisci invade the gap together. They basically move at almost the same speed, and we call that a stable configuration. So if you plot the meniscus position versus time, uh, in the upper case, in the blue symbols, they, the two menisci propagate at almost the same rate through the gap. We're going to call that stable, and you get just um, the blue picture. You're going to get two droplets out of it. And uh, the red, the two menisci uh, hit the gap. They try to go together. There's an instability. One loses, one wins, and you get one drop out of it. 
And so I now want to think about how do you talk about this problem in the context of what's called the Safman-Taylor instability, the viscous fingering instability. So that's kind of the, the picture of what we had. And um, so uh, we made a little mathematical model. Um, and we just thought about this as a one-dimensional problem. So the title of my talk was Seeking Simplicity in Complex Fluids. Um, so the simplicity here is I'm going to replace everything by a one-dimensional picture, just flow in one direction. And the only parameter you have to worry about is the shape of the gap, which sets something in fluid mechanics called the permeability, the resistance to flow. And it turns out the permeability in small-scale systems varies with the square of the smallest dimension. And uh, so it turns out my group was the first group in, in 60 years that asked, what happens if you do this, this kind of problem, the so-called Safman-Taylor problem, where the gap varies with position? And we analyzed this. And um, our analysis is if you uh, a simplified model that says you want to predict meniscus position versus time, this is the experiment. Just qualitatively, I just wanted you to see that if the, the speed, which is characterized by the so-called capillary number is a small number, you get something that looks unstable, and if the speed is sufficiently high, they go together, and you get something that you'd call stable. And so we were able to rationalize everything about this problem using this one-dimensional one model. Okay, but then it pointed out to us that we could go back to the picture that Safman and Taylor first had, which is flow in between two planes, which is a very um, model configuration, except now we're going to change the angle between the two planes. Okay, so in the so-called Safman and Taylor picture, if you invade a low viscosity fluid into a high viscosity fluid, it is always unstable. All surface tension can do is try to rescue you, but it can never stop fingers from forming. We now ask this question if we do an experiment not with a uniform gap, but with a gap that varies with position in an angle. Okay, so here's, here's how I'm going to end. Um, this upper picture is the Safman Taylor problem. Oops. You, this was supposed to start automatically. You, hello. You have a uniform, you have a unif you, two uniform plates. You invade air into oil. You try to push the oil out of the way. It can't do it. Air or water doesn't work. Um, and it forms a finger. The, and this finger just propagates through and you leave all the other fluid behind it. You now do the identical experiment except you incline the plate slightly. So here you make the angle negative, so it, the, the geometry is getting progressively narrower. And in this case, you do the identical experiment and you stabilize the so-called Safman-Taylor or viscous fingering instability only using geometry. And it, point, it turns out that there's a critical speed above which you'd get the upper picture. And if you go slow enough, you get the lower picture. And so we, we kind of explored this idea of how geometry changes the stability characteristics of a flow. OK, so why is it inhibited? There's surface tension. You move a meniscus along the flow direction. It gets shorter. You create what's called a capillary pressure gradient. OK, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. That's my first story. OK, that's story one. Okay. Um, story two is uh, uh, sponsored uh, part of the MURI, the o &R. It has to do with so-called liquid-infused surfaces. It has to do with the idea of can you reduce drag on surfaces by uh, embedding uh, either air or liquid in the surface. You know, I'm, I know this is a long um, area of research in, in the Navy, trying to put air on surfaces. My impression is they almost always fail because you can never keep the liquid there. Um, so what I'm going to say is my group picked a slightly different question to look at than the standard question. The standard question is how do uh, hydrophobic surfaces Air-infused surfaces or liquid-infused surfaces, how do, they give, how do they give rise to slip? My group instead asked, how do they fail? Okay, so that's the story I'm going to tell you. Okay, so there are lots of interest in so-called liquid-infused surfaces. You take any kind of porous material, you, uh, fill it e you fill it either with air or gas or a liquid, and then when this, flu this material is placed in contact with another liquid, the liquid on the outside, might be water in a naval application, sees a, a surface that at least has a, a fair amount of liquid on it, and that should give a lower drag. Okay, that's the concept. There's a lot of wor work. I mean, the, the first experiments in the fluid mechanics field that we know go back to a patent by a Schlumberger group in 2011. Um, and almost everybody in this field especially people numerically and experimentally, they ask, what is the slip length? What is the effective 
velocity along a surface that's primarily liquid coated. Okay, and and they, they often picture something like this, a surface, which is a solid. The green is a liquid that's hopefully trapped in this pore space. And uh, you have a flow over it, blue, because you're thinking about water. And uh, if there was a no-slip condition, the velocity would be zero. But because it's a liquid, you could expect some finite velocity. And uh, lots of people have studied this. And my group asked a different question. My group asked, how do you keep the liquid here? Because if it experiences a stress, it's going to leave. And so we asked, how do you keep the system from failing? And uh, so we produced a, a, an experiment and an argument that tells you the design you need to choose so that you can always have the, some part of the liquid stay in the substrate. So we, we designed against failure. That was the claim. That was the suggestion. Okay, so I'll, let me just show you how the experiment works. I'll just give you an idea of the modeling. And um, I have colleagues who are, who are uh, trying to use this on a larger length scale. So we, we make a small scale experiment again. This is what it looks like from the side. We can control the flow speed of, say, uh, water. Um, above it, and then we, on one surface, we microfabricate a pattern. We put a liquid in it that has a, a dye in it so that we can visualize it. And, um, and then for a given flow rate or shear stress, we ask, um, does the liquid stay in this pattern? And uh, viewed from above, it looks like this. This is a few millimeters wide. This green pattern are 50 small grooves, 10 microns, each in dimensions. You have to microfabricate uh, this. Y you need to do that because you want to retain the liquid. If it's too big, the liquid just gets swept out of the way. And that's why most studies of these super hydrophobic or liquid infused surfaces always fail after a short time. You apply shear stress, the liquid disappears. So I'm going to show you how you can apply a shear stress and at least some part of the liquid stays. Is that clear? So we control a flow rate, commonly called Q in fluid mechanics. It's really applying a shear stress. And the link to turbulent flows, by the way, that my colleagues, uh, Marcus Holtmark and Lex Smith, are working on is they've uh, been able to show that if you apply these small scale ideas that we've been using, but talk about them in terms of the shear stress, some of the ideas we're talking about apply to a turbulent flow. OK, so the experiment looks like this. There's the top view. Uh, flow, in this case, is water flowing over an oil that's trapped in these small microgrooves. And um, when you turn on the flow, the liquid is uh, swept away on the left, um, but it, let's see if I move it out of the way. Um, there's a finite length where you, the, the fluid stays trapped, even though there's a, there's a shear stress. So there's a, a finite length scale where you can trap the fluid. OK, so this part of the talk, I can now stop here, because I can now tell you that if you were to ever tell me what the shear stress is, then I will tell you, we will tell you about what this length scale is. And then you just pattern materials so that they always have this length scale as the smallest pattern. And then you're guaranteed that the liquid will stay trapped in there because the shear stress can't get rid of it. OK, so that's kind of the conceptual framework. Um, there's, because there involve two fluids, either air and a liquid, air and water, or oil and water, there's a surface tension. That's a symbol gamma. Um, you have to talk about what, uh, a contact angle that's not important. And in this case, the uh, fluid in the little cavities was 40 times as viscous as water. OK, so the time sequence looked like this. And this L infinity is the design parameter that we kind of uncovered after doing many experiments which was uh, a critical length below which you're guaranteed the liquid will stay in the cavity independent of the shear stress, so long as the shear stress is below the level that sets that length. And um, you know, from a side view, you'd say, oh, I have flow in a channel. This could be a turbulent flow. It could be a laminar flow. The fluid is uh, trapped in the cavities. It's getting driven into the page. But what eventually happens is if the cavity is finite, the interface can deform. The deformation of the interface means there's surface tension. Surface tension creates a pressure gradient. And in these little cavities, the fluid just circulates. And there's a detailed model to keep track of all the different ways the fluid can be driven. And um, so you can do experiments. You can uh, measure experimentally what this length is, this length below which everything stays, all the liquid stays. You can vary the flow rate, which is just varying the shear stress. And you can do this for many different liquid combinations. And for reasons that I don't understand in this literature, the ratio of the external viscosity to the internal viscosity in the grooves is called n. I don't really like it, but if everyone else chooses it, you're forced to choose it. So that's what. So there are many different experiments. And they all have the feature that L gets shorter as the shear stress goes up or as the flow stress 
shear stress goes up or the flow rate goes up. And um, the higher the external viscosity, the shorter the length is. Um, but you can make a little scaling theory and collapse all these to a universal curve if you understand uh, what the viscosity ratio is and how it affects the dynamics. So we discovered uh, kind of by doing a little analysis what this function n is. And um, you, you now have a design criteria that uh, if you turn on a flow and you uh, discover this length, what you do for a real system is you micro-pattern it. We discovered a way to make chemical patterns. And if you uh, do the same experiment as the one above, but now you treat it chemically so that you have um, this length scale pattern, you retain the liquid almost over the entire surface. So it's not primarily liquid with a lot of solid, it's primarily liquid. And if it's primarily liquid, you can expect a significant slip. Okay, so that's kind of my short story talking through what are called liquid-infused surfaces. And our goal was to, uh, when we started the project, was to, in my group, understand how you design to keep the liquid there. Okay. Okay, so that was too, I, I'm probably talking too fast. Am I talking too fast? Uh, <laughs> okay, um, yeah. So that, really for both of them that you covered, can you break that down to just what's a real basic then application for the Navy? Yeah, so here, so the, the suggestion uh, for the Navy is to, to create, say, external surfaces that are not solid, but are solid with either a trapped gas or a trapped liquid. You know, for a long time, I don't, you guys know much better than me, for a long time people have said, take torpedoes, coat them in a cavity of air, and they'll go f uh, faster than the torpedo itself. Or longer. Or distance longer, distance right. But the, the challenge is, how do you keep the cavity of air or liquid around the surface? Okay, so here, uh, what you do is you, if, if, if you knew the maximum shear stress that the system might see, which is set by a speed, then if this theory would apply and this, or these model experiments, I will tell, we would tell you a typical length scale you have to pattern the surface at so that in the presence of flow, it doesn't look like liquid being uh, transported only to one end with a lot of solid present. It looks like liquid being retained over the entire surface. And if liquid were retained, then you can imagine the liquid-liquid contact has a lower friction than liquid-solid contact. So, the, so if we're talking like the surface of a ship that is low water, for example, interacting with the water that it's going through, that would be theoretically a, we burn less fuel right. to go that would, distance. That would be the suggestion. There's less friction. Right. That would be the suggestion. Okay. And, and, and you have to um, choose uh, you know, what is the criteria you want. So I will just say, uh, there's some chemistry involved in choosing the liquids because the chemistry has to like the solid. And there's a viscosity ratio between the trapped liquid and the outside liquid. Now the higher the viscosity that you trap, the more solid like it is, right? So in this case, with a fluid that's trapped, that's 40 times as viscous as water, the so-called drag reduction you get isn't 100%, might be 10%. So, and so then you have to decide, is 10% is a benefit to you or not? It's a benefit, but are you, is it enough? And I can't, I, I'm not in a position to answer that. I can only suggest the designs or the experiments that show that this works. And I can say, if you trap air, right? If you trap air, that has a very low viscosity. You get a, a, a large drag reduction. The problem has been over the years is the air never stays there. And so the system, you design it, it looks like it'll be nice, put in water, behaves just like a solid surface because the air doesn't stay. So our designs were trying to get the, the fluid, the air or liquid, to stay. One here and then one here. Yeah. Uh, uh, have you guys thought about dynamically changing the length, uh, the length of these? Uh, okay, I guess we've, we've, so we've thought about it. We haven't done anything on it. Uh, the, the closest we've done on, on something like this is we have an experiment, I have the video on my laptop, where we used a, I, I've shown this to, to Keon before, a um, magnetic fluid, a so-called ferrofluid, because the ferrofluids you can move around with magnets. Um, and so we have one design where the, where the microfabricated grooves have a ferrofluid in them, and then we can 
make the ferrofluid pop out or go down by using an external magnet, but we didn't ever try it in any real controlled way. We just showed it sort of worked. Yeah. So could you vary the width of those grooves? Yeah. Could you do a uniform? Yeah. I try to pay very close attention, but I haven't seen that element for something where you're saying there's a certain distance. Okay, so uh, I, I've been skipping little things. Okay. So, right. so there's a little equation down here that says, what is this critical length that you have to design? Okay, so in the case where you have an external fluid that's like water uh, adjacent to a more viscous fluid, there's a very simple formula that says what this length is. And uh, it's a length, so it has units of, say, meters. And it's actually just the ratio of the surface tension of the two fluids, that is a, you look up in a book, divided by the maximum shear stress you see. And the prefactors, these coefficients are all geometric, and they depend on the height, the width of the um, groove. It has nothing to do in this limit with the viscosity of the fluid in the groove, but it's all controlled by geometry. If you make it too wide, um, the fluid will uh, undergo some form of instabilities. We were talking about the circulation, so I thought it was the volume of that fluid that comes up. Yeah, the, the, yeah, the, um, the circulation is on the length, and uh, the geometry here is playing a role in what sets this critical length. But these parameters, like the height, the width, what are the radius of curvature, which is actually comparable to the width? They're just geometric. In, in the real world, we have a curved surface where pressure gradients are all in different directions. Right. What kind of parameters can Okay, so um, I've, I've thought a little about this, not a lot, because we have none of the experiments. But Keon's pointing out, look, first of all, all our experiments are on flat surfaces. And all our experiments are designed if you like, in the worst possible case. The worst possible case is the flow in the same direction as the fluid wants to go. So um, I think the answer to Keon's question is, what would you do in the real world case where you don't know which direction the water is flowing relative to the ship when it's at rest in dock or whatever, it's just uh, the current. I think then it's quite likely the cavities have to be nearly square and they have to be fabricated at, at, at such a scale that they have to be somewhat below L infinity, um, but, but still, roughly square, so it doesn't matter which direction you might go. But we haven't done that. Yeah? And also the, the solid, the material that the ship is made of, does that not play a role? No. It well, it only plays a role through chemistry, and you need to choose the, the liquid that you put in the cavity to like the solid. So that's where the solid plays a role. But from a fluid mechanics perspective, the outside fluid just sees a solid and the solid sets a no-slip boundary condition. So from a fluid mechanics point of view, it's just asking what's the boundary condition normally between liquid and solid. Fluid mechanics person would say no slip. Um, the choice of the solid, though, affects the choice of the liquid because the liquid has the, the liquid you put in the cavity has to want to stay in the cavity. If it doesn't stay in the cavity, all bets are off. Okay? Yeah? You guys are much better than an academic group, I must say. The academic group never asks anything. Yeah, so all of this is centimeter scales are smaller. The grooves are measured in tens to hundreds of microns in widths. So if you have the induced fluid, if it is in ferrous, uh, the fluid is what kind of methodology you use to induce the end of fluid into that groove? Well, so in this case, you, because the liquids in the grooves like the grooves, you just have to put the liquid in contact and it wicks in or you put it in with a pressure-driven flow. So that, that part's just kind of loading a system just with a pump. Okay, so that's, that's the short story. Okay, so, um, all right, so this next one is kind of odd. I don't know if there's anyone in the audience that works with kind of multi-phase flows, bubbly flows. I'm gonna show you something that looks so simple, you're gonna, you're gonna swear that someone must have done this. And all I'm gonna tell you is, I've given this talk lots of places in front of all the experts, and no one's noticed it. And it's a flaw in the way academics do research. So it goes like this. I'm going to tell you about a very simple piping element. It's even covered in textbooks. Um, and I'm going to tell you about Reynolds numbers that are actually, for me, large. I often do low Reynolds number flows. These Reynolds numbers aren't turbulent, but they're in the range of 100 to 1,000. I'm going to tell you about T-shapes. T-shapes come up in all engineering systems. They come up in all laboratory systems. And they come up in natural physiological systems like that are inside our brain, inside us. Okay, and I'm going to tell you about shapes that have the form of a T, 
but uh, very specifically, I'm going to tell you about the flow that's in the top of the T and then out symmetrically at the sides. That's a specific example I'm going to show you. But it's, it's kind of generic. Okay. You're going to claim, and, and, I, I, and I want to be respectful of this, lots of people have studied this. That's true. Lots of people have even done simulations on this. And you could experiments are hard if you can't look inside if you don't do it with glass. But, um, so let me just show you the kind of idea. We were asked by a, a, a power uh, system to look in, 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 in a geometry like this, and they were interested in um, Reynolds numbers of this order, 100 to 1,000, the Reynolds number being the density of the fluid, the average speed you'd measure in the main channel, the typical geom geometric length divided by the viscosity. And uh, you can do the experiment different ways, but again, I'm always going to do it so the inflow is from the top. Uh, so you call that the bottom of the T and then out the sides. Okay. So if you do this experiment with rigid particles, say uh, glass particles in water, then there are no surprises. The fluid comes in at the top and leaves at the sides. The particles come in at the top, they leave at the sides. There's nothing unusual. Um, except that if you pay attention to the particles, their trajectories can be a little awkward because the Reynolds number is high and the particles are more dense than the fluid. Okay? In fact, the reason we were studying this was uh, a, a, a group in, uh, interested in a, a power reactor where they needed very clean water and they were very concerned that small particles in the water would hit the surface where there was an oxide film, crack the film and make more particles. So this was the study we started. Okay? And we answered, we, we actually gave them a useful result. But one day, bubbles got stuck in the experiment. So by accident, same kind of experiment, the fluid's going to come in at the top, the fluid's going to leave at the sides, but the little dots you see are bubbles. Uh, the dimension here is a few millimeters, so the bubbles are hundreds of microns. Okay. The bubbles are less dense than water, no surprises there. The orientation of the channel doesn't matter. So there is a, an effect of density difference, but gravity has nothing to do with what I'm about to show you. And when you do this experiment at Reynolds numbers of a few hundred, and you take a high-speed video of it for a couple seconds, you might expect that all the bubbles come in should leave. But instead, something else happens. Uh, the bubbles accumulate at the junction. They accumulate in a place where you wouldn't ordinarily expect something to accumulate. In fact, if the system were to clog here, you'd normally say, well, maybe something awkward came in. Nothing awkward came in. It's an accumulation phenomena at the junction. I'm, not, I'm going to tell you exactly where this comes from. Um, anyway, so this has been uh, of great interest to my group. We, we got very curious how this ever happens and, and, and why it happens. Okay, so that's the phenomena. I don't know if you find it. If you don't find it interesting, we can go to the last part of the talk. Um, but the, the, uh, I'm going to play it again. Um, because there's something important. When there, this is only bubbles? No th there are no particles in here. This happens provided the objects in the fluid are less dense than the fluid. Okay. There's an accumulation phenomena that the flow drives. It's a three-dimensional flow. Um, oh, so let me say w what this isn't. So if you took a fluid mechanics class or you go talk to a professor, they would say, oh, the flow comes in at the middle and the flow goes out at the sides. That's sort of true. That picture won't explain anything about what you see, because what it would suggest is that there's a stagnation point in the middle, there's a higher pressure in the middle, everything should go away. Hmm. Not quite true. Okay, so um, let me just say this is quite generic. Um, if you change the angles, so we've done a whole study on changing the angles. If the Reynolds number is too low, which means the flow is too low, all the bubbles leave. Uh, if you pay attention, they come in and you see them swirling going out, but all the bubbles leave. If now in this flow system you double the flow speed, which doubles the Reynolds numbers, you trap bubbles. Okay. So from the standpoint of uh, mathematical characterization, you'd say there's a bifurcation that happens. The flow structure changes above a critical speed or a critical Reynolds number. My colleague Clancy Rowley, who studies nonlinear dynamics, likes to call this a bifurcation and a bifurcation. Um, as far as I know, no one had ever observed this before, even in the single phase flow that's behind this. I'm going to explain everything by saying this is a single phase flow phenomenon that the people that had studied it completely missed. And it has a consequence for multiphase flows because the three dimensional flow structures that get created are capable of trapping objects. Whether or not this is important, that I don't know, I, but I've, I've talked about this to a lot of people. Okay. 
So, so here are the important things. You're allowed to now ask in the next few minutes, why above a critical flow speed do you trap something? Um, why do the bubbles sort of form lines? If you're familiar with turbulent flows, I'll, I'll say that. Why does anything get trapped in the first place? What sets the critical Reynolds number? And I'm going to claim that you can answer these questions only by understanding what the single phase flow does in this very simple geometry. And it baffles me why the high Reynolds number flow community that has studied this for, for uh, ever kind of completely missed this picture. Um, but I could speculate on that. Ooh, I'm being recorded. I better be careful when I say. Right. Yeah? If I remember from your experimental stuff, this is actually a channel that we're looking at. Like yeah. channel rather it, than a yeah, geometry doesn't matter too much. So whether it's a circle or a square is a detail. And, I'll, and the re- I was just thinking it's, it's nominally two-dimensional in and out of the plane of the flow, really. Um, I mean, the, the geometry is nominally. Yes, and the flow is very three-dimensional. Yes, yes. That's and, and that's the key, right? right. And in fact, um, here's a case where I, I have to be careful because I like trying to make problems simpler. Here's a case for two years in trying to make it simpler, I, we couldn't, we couldn't explain anything. And then one of our colleagues brought us a three-dimensional simulation that helped, helped us see the, the structure. Um, OK, so what I need to tell you about is uh, most of you are sitting here with your elbows bent. So what I need to tell you about is the simplest flow configuration that normally isn't talked about in books, which is a simple bend. And in the fluid mechanics world, this is known as Dean flow, because Dean in the 1920s uh, examined the velocity profile in a bend. Now, the velocity profile is nearly uh, the laminar flow configuration. It's very nearly a parabola and cross-section. But in trying to go around a corner when the Reynolds number is high, you create so-called secondary flows. The flow becomes three-dimensional. And um, the I just means the inner part of the tube. The O means the outer part of the tube. And so at high Reynolds numbers, when a fluid tries to go around a corner in a pressure-driven flow, it does two helices. I think that's the velocity distribution. And the, the speed of the secondary flow relative to the main flow is a function of the Reynolds number. So there are actually two vortices sitting in a, any curved flow, sitting in your blood vessels going when the Reynolds number is modest. And if you now look at uh, this movie, um, what you know if you study turbulence is people add bubbles to turbulent flows because regions of high vorticity, regions of high circulation, trap the bubbles. Instead of a rock on a string where the rock gets thrown out because it's more dense than the surrounding air, if it's low density, it gets driven to the center of the bubbles. And so if you look at this movie, you'll see that there are actually two lines of bubbles. You, you can s sort of start to see they form a line. If you look very closely, you might think that you see two lines. So inside this flow are two vortices on either side, and the vortices can trap bubbles. Now, that only says, I have to be careful, that, that just says bubbles can get pushed to the center of the vortices. Why do they get stuck in the middle of the pipe? Why do they get trapped in this section? So let me just show you what a numerical simulation shows about flow in a pipe. Now, we are not the first to do this either, but I think we are the first, for whatever crazy reason, to put them all on the same picture and then ask, what happens when you systematically change Reynolds number? And when you do this, um, the streamlines uh, which go around a bend, they start to produce these helical paths. That's the blue lines, they're the streamlines. The flow is steady below a Reynolds number of almost 600. And the green is a region of high vorticity where the fluid is circulating pretty high. And in the neighborhood of the Reynolds number 600, it turns out, there's a phenomena that creates a so-called stagnation point inside the fluid. Now, uh, now, the language in aeronautics is called vortex breakdown. I don't know if anyone has heard this term. There might be a few of you. I, I had heard this term. I didn't know much about it before this. Um, it's normally talked about with flow, high speed flow over airplane wings where you get a vortex, and then at some point the vortex blows up and just goes crazy. And that's called uh, instability, and it's called vortex breakdown. Um, in experiments, it's only ever seen where if you take a pipe flow and you have flow in a pipe, and you spin the pipe really fast so you get rotation, then you get, when you put in dye, you get a vortex. It just goes running out of the tube. And then all of a sudden it bursts and creates this little so-called bubble region of vortex breakdown. I'm going to claim it happens in a pipe. So I'm not going to tell you that, in fact, inside a pipe, you get vortex breakdown because above a critical Reynolds number, if you follow some of the streamlines, they go, they create a, a vortex, they go spinning, they hit a stagnation point, and they go running back. So above a critical flow speed, you get internal stagnation points in the fluid. 
in the flow. Do you, do you see kind of what I'm getting at? And, and because you're not going to believe me, because you're going to say, oh, this is a numerical simulation done badly, here's an experiment that shows the same thing. The, uh, there's a, a bubble trapped at a, at a place that you'd ordinarily think nothing should be trapped at. The bubbles come in, they go spinning on the outside of vortex, and then you can see they come running back down the middle. So above critical Reynolds numbers, in these very simple geometries are bifurcations, and the bifurcations can trap, trapped, can trap low density structures. Okay, that's the moral of the story. Doesn't look like any bubbles that um, this experiment, this experiment, you add surfactant to lowers the coalescence rate. They slowly coalesce with to form this big bubble. You know, if you if you went to uh, any university and gave this picture to uh, a typical professor, and they drew the, you know, a, a little 2D picture. They'd claim the middle point should be an unstable stagnation point. Clearly, anything that comes near it, near it should be going away. In fact, it's the most stable place in the flow above a critical Reynolds number. OK, so now here's your puzzle. So now I'm going to ask you the following question. Suppose I say clean water. So this is a picture of dirty water. We're going to now turn on clean water, and we're going to ask how long it takes to clean. And, and most people would say cleaning time should be length divided by velocity. But because of vortex breakdown happening above a critical Reynolds number, it turns out you trap ink. You trap the dirty water. And now it takes this part of the flow much longer to clean because there are three-dimensional structures inside the flow. Everyone see that? So uh, you know, is it a big effect? I don't know. But it's a topological effect that was unappreciated in the fluid mechanics world. Here at Reynolds numbers, almost 1,000. Okay. Here, you just, if you give it long enough, it'll eventually go away. But um, more of the point is you have these structures inside the flow, and most people are unaware of them. Yeah, and in fact, that's actually that's a great point. If you did this experiment at slightly lower Reynolds numbers, then those structures wouldn't exist, and it would clean faster. But, you, but, but what that critical Reynolds number is depends on the geometry. OK, so my last story, and then I'll, I'll stop, and, um, is uh, something we stumbled on in the last year, which is how do you clean water? H or I should say, how, a way you might be able to remove particles from water. And we're going to use CO2 to do it. OK, so this is a chemistry problem I'm going to tell you about. But even for chemists, I'm going to tell you something that most chemistry professors are unaware of. And then it has a fluid mechanical consequence. OK, so. Um, if you uh, take a chemistry class, a physical chemistry class, they tell you that uh, any time you put a surface in contact with a liquid, it's charged. Glass and water is always negatively charged. Normally, there's a, a chemistry reason for that. The glass molecules ionize. And therefore, if you have, have any kind of solute in solution that has charge, there's a region near the surface that has primarily the opposite charges than the surface. So if the surface is negatively charged and you have solutes in solution, there are more positive charges near the surface. These pictures are always misleading because most of the molecules are water sitting everywhere. And it's just that the, there are few extra positive charges near the surface. And the region where you have the charge is called the Debye screening length. And this length is very short, tens of nanometers. And for most fluid mechanicians, we, we ignore it. But here's a problem, it turns out. We ignore it because it's so small. But here's a, I'm going to show you a problem where you can't ignore it. And we didn't discover this, by the way. This has been known for a while. I'll, I'll tell you what we discovered. But this idea is, is very well known. Charged surfaces, a region where you have mobile ions in water. That's called the Debye screening length. And um, far away from the surface, you just have everything is electrically neutral. You don't care. Okay. This picture says the following thing. If you take water and it has sodium chloride in it, sodium chloride is a one-to-one -one electrolyte. And you have potassium chloride, a one-to-one -one electrolyte. From equilibrium points of view, they are identical. They have no difference. OK, the phenomena I'm going to show you works when it, it's going to remove particles when you use sodium chloride. And it won't work when you use potassium chloride. And I'm going to explain why. There's a, a basic reason why. You know, and so you're allowed to now ask yourself, what's different about these two salts? What was that? That's close, but you need to say something else about what the size does. OK, so uh, the other thing you need is what's called osmotic pressure. Osmotic pressure is just the idea that if you have a solute of a certain concentration, then there are molecular effects. So you multiply a concentration by an energy, and you get the typical pressure that is created by the Brownian motion of the ions. OK, that's 
osmotic pressure. That's also important here. A little less important, but uh, if you ever read about this, it comes up. Okay. So here's an experiment. I'm going to show you an experiment from eight years ago from a French group. They did a very elegant experiment that showed salt allows you to manipulate fluids in a very uh, predictive way. So if you have a particle in fluid and you apply a force to it, it moves at a certain velocity. Predict the velocity. So they did the following experiment. They took a small channel. I just look at the one on the left. They take a small channel and they had salt everywhere. That's what they mean by buffer. And in the central channel, they actually put in some particles. Now, the images down here are cross sections through the channel. So the top one is just what the cross section of the channel looked like when you put in gold particles. And the cross section was a rectangle because the particles filled the whole channel. And when you went downstream, they were identical. There was no effect of Brownian motion of the small particles. These particles were maybe a micron. Uh, the speeds are so fast, the particles can't move at all. OK, now they only do the following thing. Identical experiment, they put a little salt outside. And when they put a little out salt outside, the stream gets wider. They manipulate the width where their particles by only putting salt outside. And if they put salt inside, the width gets narrower. So they manipulated the system only using salt. So you're allowed to say, well, how does that happen? And what can you use it for? OK, is that, is that sort of clear? I haven't explained why, but I've showed you a phenomenon. Okay. Oh, no, the fluid, you're pumping it in. You're pumping the fluid. Oh, ah, good point. No, what's, what's happening here is the particles are moving relative to the fluid. Yeah. Uh, and I'll show you more just directly. OK, so what's going on? So there's a phenomenon called diffusiophoresis. Phoresis being directed motion. Diffusio because it has to do with something diffusing. And in the classic literature from the 1960s, it relates to something that's sometimes called the diffusion potential. It's how the presence of salt creates local electric fields. It goes like this. Suppose I take a bath of water, pure water on one side, and I put sodium chloride on the other side. Now, the, the woman at the back said they're different sizes. And because they're different sizes, the sodium ions, which are here in red, they diffuse at a slightly different rate than the blue ones, which are the chlorine. So when you remove a barrier, the two ions diffuse at slightly different rates. Let's see if I can do this. They diffuse at slightly different rates, and it turns out the chlorine ion diffuses faster than sodium ion. Not a lot, 50% faster, but faster. And because the negative charge gets slightly separated from the positive charge, you create a local electric field. And because you create a local electric field and all objects in water are charged, the objects move. And so in this problem, you create an electric field. Okay. And that's going to be responsible for moving particles. I'm going to show you it's very dramatic. Okay. So now suppose you do the experiment on the right. You take potassium chloride, you put it on the right. You take sodium chloride, you put it on the left. You give this, and, and now we're going to remove the barrier. You give this problem to any professor at an American university, well, probably any university, and let's say they're the same. Sodium chloride, one to one electrolyte. Potassium chloride, one to one electrolyte. They're identical. Ah, someone's, uh, but they're not because the potassium ion diffuses at the same rate as the chloride ion. So on the right, they diffuse at the same rate. There's no big effect. But the sodium ion diffuses at a different rate than the chlorine ion. And so uh, on the left, you get a, an electric field. And so when you look at this problem and, 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 ex and try and rationalize it, it's exactly the one on the left. Because sodium chloride, the two ions, cation and anion, have different so-called mobilities. Potassium chloride, they have identical mobilities. OK, so the way you explain this, this phenomena is particles are charged, and they are going to follow the fastest diffusing ion. So if you're negatively charged, you follow the, the, if the positive ion if it's a faster, or you go opposite the negative ion. OK, so here's we got interested in how do you remove particles? How do you do anything when flow can't penetrate? So if I give you like a cloth, and it has dead end pores or a carpet, how do I get things out of the carpet? I can't flow through the carpet because there's a floor underneath, but I can flow over the carpet and I can put things in the um, carpet. So it goes like this. Um, diffusion constants, you look up in books, their are energies divided by resistances. And if um, I give you a channel that's 100 microns long and you only have Brownian motion of a one micron sized object, it takes you five hours to get things out. So we did the following experiment. We uh, filled uh, small channels, dead end pores, cavities, a couple hundred microns long with fluids. And then we just have a flow in a main channel. The flow cannot penetrate the 
side channel because the side channel is closed. But what we can manipulate is the salt concentration difference between the main channel and the side channel. And so the experiment goes like this. Um, it, it's going to show up well on my laptop. I'm not sure it's going to show up here. The one on the left, the salt concentration in the two is the same. The one on the right, the salt concentration is high in the pore and low in the main channel. And we put particles in the main channel, and we ask, can we get them in the pore? And if there's a concentration difference, you can get them in the pore. I think you can, you can kind of see you get something into the pore. It's driven by the concentration difference. If the same concentration everywhere, the particles don't go in the pore. Okay, um, here's a better picture of it. Uh, you drive particles into the pore, even though there's no net flow. That was your question. There's no net flow, but what there is is a concentration difference. The concentration difference creates forces, and it moves the particles relative to the fluid. If you reverse the sign of the concentration differences, you can take things out of pores. Okay. All right. So, and this is a big effect. If it takes an hour to do something without the salt, with the salt, it takes 20 minutes, 10 minutes. So this is the thing we've been focusing on. And we've um, shown that it depends on size. So if you do this kind of experiment with um, small particles, 60 nanometers in size, versus uh, one micron size, 1,000 nanometers, the big particles go faster than the little particles. We don't exactly understand why. We have a, uh, done a little work on that. Um, but we can manipulate particles with salt, and we can manipulate particles by size. I'm running out of time, so I'll just now end uh, this. Uh, so you can also separate particles because there's a size effect. If you have two different, if you have a suspension of many sized particles, then the um, large particles, which are here green, go faster than the red particles. So you can move them further in the pore, and you can also, if you continue this, you could separate them. Um, this is a robust phenomenon. It doesn't matter what the pores look like. The pores could be kind of re-entering cavities. The pores could have separate shapes. If you have a concentration difference, you can drive things into them. If you reverse the concentration difference, you can pull things out of them. Okay? Okay, so in my last slide, I'm going to show you what we did related to water. Suppose you have particles in water. Now, I'm not going to talk about bacteria because I'm not sure how bacteria behave this way. We haven't done a careful study on that. But if you have particles in water, what I now want to suggest is that if you only put the water in contact with a soluble gas, in this case we use CO2, you can create streams of clean water. The systems are small, so I won't claim that you're going to get a gallon of water out right away, but I'm going to first just try to describe a phenomena. So here is the phenomena. You take a stream, it's going to have particles in it, you're going to make it flow left to right, and I'm going to show you how on one side you get the stream with particles in it, and on the other side you get a particle-free stream. And the way you do it is you put CO2 in contact with a porous surface, and the CO2, when it dissolves in water, I think it's over here, yeah, the CO2 dissolves in water, it forms cations and anions. The cation is small, and it diffuses very fast. Because on the CO2 side, you produce cations, which diffuse very fast in the transverse direction, they pull negative particles along with them. And the consequence of it is, when you look at the end of the channel, all the particles are on one side. And coming out the other side is particle-free water. And so it's a physical chemistry-based, out-of-equilibrium system for manipulating small objects. And you know, a question we're struggling with, um, this is taking particles out without a filter, so it's relatively low energy, but there's a scale-up issue. And there's a question, can you do this on a large scale? That's something I don't know. That's something we're trying to think about. OK, so I'll stop. I've used my 55 minutes. I've told you a number of stories. Um, that relate to multiphase flows and what in the field would be complex fluids, those fluids that have things in them. And I've tried to point out places where the geometries are simple, but the results are might be counterintuitive, and I'll stop with that. Thank you.